Praise the Lord. It's kind of hard once you've preached about washing dishes to be able to bring up a dish and do that again. Kind of like that brother that used to minister. He was born with cerebral palsy and everybody kind of gave up on him. You may remember him. He was doing great going across the nation, sharing the word of God, using almost the same messages in every five meetings from week to week to week. And then Jerry Falwell had him on television at his church there in Virginia. <laughs> he told Brother Falwell later, he said, you know, you've ruined me. Now I've got to go and come up with some more messages. Kind of hard once people have seen your big toe sticking through a hole in your sock to preach about the things that are hidden from everybody else. And other things along that line. So while I love a good visual aid message, you got to keep finding visual aids. Amen. I don't have necessarily one except me. And I don't know how much of an aid that is. It might be an asset or, or liability rather, but pray for me. Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse number 3, if you've got your Bibles available to you, just let's just jump in there and, and, and check it all out. In fact, go to verse 1. Is that okay? Did, will I mess you up if I go to verse 1? Thorne, you're so good. You know, your mom and dad did such an outstanding job raising you. Outstanding, I say. I'm praying about Ryan, but they did a great job with you, Thorne. I, I'm kidding. Good to have you all back with us. Amen. Don't go away. Amen. Chapter 3 of the book of Philippians, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it's safe. You know, I sometimes wonder if, if I preach something that I've preached before here, is somebody going to catch that and call me on it? But the truth of the matter is, if it was good enough to preach the first time, it's good enough to preach another time. Somebody say Amen. And it's not about trying to not repeat yourself or appear to not have anything new. It's about sharing something that's important that maybe somebody wasn't here before that needs to hear it now. Because I have learned, folks, things have changed. Brother Gardner was with us here a few months back, and he looked around and he asked somebody here at the church, he said, who are all these people? I don't know any of these people. He said, I don't hardly know more than a handful in here. And I'm going to blame you, Shirley, that you were the one he was talking to. She just said, God's been bringing us new people in. And that's what it's about, folks. It's not about trying to keep all that which we've had, but that we grow and we continue to see growth in the church. Somebody jump in and say amen. Hallelujah. Go on to verse 2 there. He says, beware of dogs. <laughs> Trust me, after being bit by one, I am very... Oh, Bewaring of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. He's speaking about circumcision that's being promoted to the early believers there and specifically in Philippi. He says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He goes on, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so, Paul said, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him oh hallelujah that I, I'm going to say that again I, that I may know him I know you heard it before but let me say it again that I might know him somebody say amen and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection 
from the dead. Wow. Is that not some powerful scripture? Is that not something glorious? It, it, apparently, I'm the only one feeling it this morning. Apparently, y'all are all disconnected. Get, take a moment, connect. Put the, put the positive wire on the positive side and the negative wire on the negative side and then feel the jolt. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, there's something wonderful about the Word of God when it speaks to us in such a way. I said, well, Brother Nolan, it really didn't do anything for me. Read it again. I'm tempted, but I'm going to keep moving on because we're all looking to get down to Shoney's before the Methodists do. I want to ask you this question. Who should this church be like? Who should this church be like? You know what I'm talking about. Let's pray and I'll come right back to it. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, touch us today. Minister to us today. Show us, God, Lord, yourself, God, Lord, strong and mighty. Show us, God, Lord, Father, you with the power, God, to do in us what needs to be done. Help us in the name of Jesus Christ to do what we need to do. Help us to be who we need to be for your glory, for your kingdom, God. For our soul's sake, I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. I, I wonder, have you ever heard this that I'm about to say to you? If you have, you know, feel free to wave, send up a smoke signal, whatever it takes. Here it comes. Are you ready? If everyone in church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Anybody heard that before? Amen. Now, I didn't catch it on Facebook this week or whatever, but... This has just been with me since Wednesday night. Wednesday night, we actually went over this same scripture here, and it just stuck. I mean, it, you know how something just sticks. And you, you, if you're going to remove it, you're going to have to remove it. And I thought, I don't want to remove it. This is good. If everyone in church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Now, they tell me that churches take on the persona, the, the, the attitude of the pastor. I think there's good and bad in that with yours truly but I'm hoping you'll grab a hold of the good stuff I'm hoping that you'll grab a hold of the good things and not necessarily what would be considered bad things in my life per se when I heard this Wednesday night it just it just went I'm telling you it, it was like brother Don says it just melted my butter and I didn't know my butter had gotten that hard but I'm thanking uh, the Lord for what he shared in my spirit that night I, I left from here that night and was just rejoicing about it and, 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 and as we discussed this and we talked about many aspects of this scripture that I just read in your hearing it caused me to start thinking about my desires and my hopes for this church this coming year I don't want us to go through the motions. I don't want us to do what we've always done and expect God to do something different. I want us to change it up a little bit. I want God to help us to be different. I want God to help us to be found perfectly in the center of His will. And honey, the only way that's going to happen is we're going to have to stop doing some things we've been doing, stop saying some things we've been saying, stop thinking some things that we've been thinking and start doing and saying and thinking a little bit differently as as long as it doesn't violate this blessed book, honey, it ought to be all right to be thought over and considered. Somebody jump in and shout amen anytime. Listen to me. I don't want us to become, as a rock and roll group did a song, I don't want us to become comfortably numb. And I'm talking spiritually speaking. If we're not careful, that's exactly what can happen to us spiritually speaking. We can become comfortably numb. We are not aware of what's going on outside the walls of this church, even in our own community. A gentleman this past week was arrested for setting fire to the old Parks Belt building downtown. And then they found out the old boy had five more gas cans and had five more buildings on his mental list. He didn't seem to be bothered by the fact that he had just admitted to committing arson and the intent to commit arson. And it bothers me that people today do what they do and they don't blink about it. They don't think about it. They absolutely have no forethought of what could this mean for me if I do this. Is it any wonder that Noah's day, the people's hearts and their 
thoughts were all filled with violence. How much more is it today that it's happening more and more and more? We're becoming much more violent. People used to talk about road rages as a, you know something to laugh at. Now they're not laughing because every time somebody gets cut off in traffic, every time somebody stops quick in front of us, we're ready to go to town. We're ready to pull out our pistols and, and just work it all out in Main Street at high noon. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong when all of our politicians are, are more concerned about what they can get you to not believe enough so that you'll still vote for them. There's a problem. We don't have any problem whatsoever with there being all kinds of things going on in Washington, D.C. I'm going to tell you what. Washington, D.C. did not create itself. We the people created it. I think we the people. Oh, here I go. I'm going to get in trouble. CIA is going to get me now. Amen. Watch it. But I think it's time we the people tell Washington, D.C. we need some change. And I don't mean just individuals. I'm talking about we need some change to bring us back to some things that we have walked away from. We've torn down all of our statues. We've tried to make everybody feel good that did not represent a large majority of the people, but a small minority. And I am not talking racially here. I'm telling you, friend, when we get to the place where we ignore our history or try to deny that it ever happened, instead of trying to learn from the fact that we have made mistakes in America, we have gone the wrong path from time to time. It's time, friend, that we stop trying to hide everything and realize there's a God in heaven that sees it all knows it all and one day he's going to reveal it all preach on brother Nolan I believe I will you see I want us to be troubled in our spirit if we are not seeing people getting saved in or through our church I want us to become spiritually disturbed if we're not seeing people getting and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire in our church I believe we need to be very upset if we are not reaching new people who are moving into our area and have no clue where to go. I thank the Lord. One of the greatest people we picked up several years ago was a young lady that moved into our area, was considering another church a few miles to the west of us here, if you will. And Sister Sharon came here. She said, I'm visiting around. I said, well, I, I'm hoping you found the place you ought to be. But I said, if we're not your cup of tea, tell me what your flavor is, and I'll help you find it so that you can enjoy it. Come on. And I don't know what happened, but something happened that day. Something happened that night. Next thing I know, where she had planned to go, she didn't go because she had found the place. And she's not the only one. There are several of you sitting here that you came here looking, hoping, praying, God, is there a place I can go and become a part? Wasn't trying to follow a cookie cutter pattern my God isn't it time that we stop trying to reproduce the same kind of a church that turns somebody else on but ain't turning everybody else on I believe it's time we become the church God wants us to be I've come to the reality and the understanding we are a rural church there is nothing wrong with that we have our place in the kingdom of God we have our duty in the will of God we have God's perfect perfect purposeful will for us through this church and it's not to be like everybody else it's to be like Jesus somebody say amen oh he's tore up now so let me ask this what would this church be like if every one of us on an individual basis became concerned about folks getting saved became concerned about people praying through to the baptism of the Holy Spirit Became concerned about people coming in and becoming a part of this fellowship of believers. I'm telling you, friend, if we start thinking alike and talking alike and acting alike in that sense, something good's going to happen. You can't prove that. Yes, I can. Go to the book of Genesis. They were building a tower called Babel. And they weren't teaching you how to speak a foreign language in six weeks. But they learned in about 60 seconds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah building a tower so high that they were going to build it up into the heavens. And they didn't understand something. Oh, they understood how to make it. They understood how to build it. They understood how to make the base broader and broader as they went higher and higher. But what they didn't know 
was the winds can run anywhere from three to 600 miles an hour up so high. What they didn't realize was the temperature drops terribly low as he gets up so high. What they didn't realize was oxygen levels drop to the point that you cannot survive there. God knew. God knew. The Bible said God looked down and said to himself, and the word, and the Holy Spirit. These people are united. They are as one. They speak the same language. They think the same thoughts. Their desire is all the same to do this. And if we don't do something, it wasn't that God didn't want them to come to him. He just knew that wasn't the way to it. Can I tell you something? God doesn't want you away from him. God doesn't want you separate from him. God wants you in his presence. God wants you in his throne room. God wants you to be, hallelujah, thanks be to God. He's got the very long arms, but he wants you to be an arm's length so he can get a hold of you. But there's some things you can't do to do that with. Young lady used to talk about how she couldn't wait to come home from school. She'd open up her Bible and fire up her doobie. And then she would read about Jesus because he was so cool. Now that sounds funny, I admit. But the truth of the matter is, you can't do it that way. You don't find Jesus through pot. I'm going to say it again. You don't find Jesus through pot. You don't find Jesus through getting high or getting drunk. You don't find Jesus from going out and making yourself sensually available to other people. There are so many things that we think, you know, they used to, even made up a song so that they could sing it on. Heaven's just a sin away. Oh, heaven's just a sin. You lying dog. Hell's a sin away. Can I, they, they got locations messed up. Amen. And I'm amazed at how many people think they can just do whatever and God is okay with it. Friend, God's not okay with whatever. God wants you to ask Him, Lord, should I or shouldn't I? Amen. That's what the former kings did. The former kings would make their plans. The Bible says, I've shared this with someone this week, the Bible says very clearly in the Word of God, man's heart plans his ways, but God directs his steps. They would decide to do something with the kingdom that they were the king over, and then they would bring in the man of God. Is this what we ought to do? Is the Lord okay with this, or do we need to not do this? And when they would do that, God would either approve or disapprove. And if God disapproved, you didn't go ahead and do it. If God disapproved it, you stopped. You changed everything. You said, well, Lord, show us what we ought to do. David, you go back and check David out. David, every time he turned around, he wanted to know, God, should we pursue or should we stay put? God, shall we go and attack or should we stay right where we're at? And God would tell him accordingly. And our problem is, is that we want God to approve it after we've done it. Not after we've planned it, after we've done it. Oh, Lord, I hope it's all right for me to buy this house. Oh, Lord, I hope it's okay for me to buy this vehicle. Oh, Lord, I hope it's okay for me to go in debt past what I can afford to pay back. I believe the Lord said, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. I just know the Lord is in this. We got people, oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble. You better pray. We got people all over this nation, this nation, running around blessing this one, blessing that one. Behold, 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 all that you put your hand to will come to, to great meaning to you and great wealth to you. And on and on. I'm so fed up with these so called prophets who are only interested in a P-R-O-F-I-T instead of a P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Preach, Brother Nolan. Those prophets, P-H-E-T, who are only interested in the prophet F-I-T, they're going to ruin people left and right. But we just blindly, I hear your voice, keep talking, I'll follow. You know, maybe what we need to do is Figure out which voice we're supposed to be listening to. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they will not follow another. 
I'm going to tell you what, you better find out who the, your shepherd is. I want my shepherd to be Jesus Christ. I love Brother Doherty, our state overseer, but if he catches this on video, I'm in trouble, but I don't care. I don't want to follow after him. He's a man. I love Tim Hill. He's our general overseer for the church of God. I love to hear that man preach. Both of those men combined. My gosh, you could have a time and a half. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to follow Tim Hill blindly. But Jesus Christ, if he says jump off the cliff, I'll say back up. I'm going to get a running start. If he says jump in the river, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to go as far as I can underneath the water and then come up, take a breath and see how much further I can go. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jesus, I'm not afraid to follow him. If he says go into the lion's den, let's go into the lion's den. If he says go into the fiery furnace, go into the fiery furnace. If he says go to jail and suffer up to your neck in mud like Jeremiah did. Friend, suffer up to your neck like Jeremiah because if God takes you there, God will take you out of there and God will deliver you at the time it's needed most in your life. Oh my God, i got to hurry. Listen, somebody sent me a statement this past week said, people used to pray, Lord, what do I need to get rid of so I can make it to heaven? Now they pray, Lord, what can I keep on doing and still make it in? Is that not true? Do I have to get rid of this? Do I have to get rid of that? Friend, there's a whole lot that we need to get rid of. Preach on, Brother Nolan. I believe I will. Now, listen to me. I don't want to become critically cynical to where that I think everything is bad. And you can do that. It's, it's too stinking easy. You can look at everything and go just plumb ape crazy over it. No, no offense, Brother Rick. You can go plumb ape crazy over it. And absolutely, that's his nickname, is ape. And I don't want him to think I think he's crazy. I called him animal because he reminds me of that guy from the Muppets on the drums. Animal! You know, and he just goes to town. But people go plumb ape crazy over all the wrong things instead of the right things. And I'm here to tell you, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll, we'll just put down everything that's going on around us. And friend, after a while, you know, it's like one guy I heard about, he asked the leaders of his church institution, what is it that I can do so that I can go to heaven? They said, well, first of all, you've got to get rid of all of your clothing that has color in it. You need to wear all white I'm cool with white shirts but you don't want me in a white suit because I promise you you'll see where I've sat and what I've sat on amen it never fails my knees will become scuffed up with whatever I fall on my knees about and I know that nobody falls on their knees in this church right nobody absolutely nobody they said you 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 need to get rid of that soft pillow that you sleep on at night because that soft pillow is going to ruin your thoughts in your sleep and you you need something more rigid more you know tough up under your head at night and they went on and they shared a couple three other things with him and i'd love to tell you that was from a church not far from here but the truth of the matter is this is from a church group back in the second century 1,800 plus years ago, this was their idea. Oh, I'll tell you right now, brother, if you cut your hair off up above your ears, if your hair's too long, there's got to be sin in your heart. Girls don't need to be wearing no britches. God didn't make britches for a woman. He made britches for a man. Woman needs to be in a skirt. Women don't cut your hair. Oh, my God, there's so many sinful women in this church right now. You ought to have it down below your waist if you're going to be glorious and holy before God. Can I just go on record and tell you, you'll be amazed at what we come up with that we claim is holiness. Let me tell you what's holy. God is holy. You know what happens when you get around a holy God, the only holy God there is, and you stay with Him and you hang around with Him and you buddy up to Him and you fall down before Him and honor Him by humbling your heart. You before long become holy like Him. Oh, you don't become Him. Don't get me wrong. You'll never replace God. God is 
not replaceable. But honey, you'll be like him. You'll walk like him. You'll talk like him. You'll think like him. You'll eat like him. You'll drink like him. You'll do whatever he does because that's what rubs off on you. Somebody say amen. Going to get in trouble. Pray for me. Paul makes it very clear to us that we cannot put any confidence in the good things of our life, if, especially if we want to make heaven our home. See, we've come to the place, folks, where we absolutely, I, I believe there were people there in Philippi trying to tell him how wonderful they were and what glorious things they did. And there's nothing wrong with having the right kind of attitude towards goodness, godliness, righteousness. But if you're not careful, before long you turn them into merit badges. Come on. You turn them into service pins or belt buckles <laughs> and stuff like that. I got so fed up. Every, I'd go to churches and they'd have all these plaques from eons ago. They weren't even at the church anymore. Those people that got those plaques weren't even at the church. And I, got, I, I, don't want, I, I told the state office, I don't want another plaque. Don't give me another plaque. I don't want a meritorious certificate of, of whatever. I, I'm, I'm fed up. I don't need something else to hang on the wall. I want to know, is my Lord satisfied with me? I want to know if my life is what he'd have it be. And when my life comes to the end of this glorious journey, I want to hear him say, he is satisfied with me. I want him to be satisfied with me. I don't want him to say, nope, son, you come up short. You had just one thing to do and you couldn't even handle that. How many times have we seen where somebody had one thing to do and they could not do that at all? Yeah, you know that person. Paul saying to them, look, if anybody can have confidence in the flesh, it's me. Let me, let me tell you about Paul. Paul said, I'm a natural born Jew. I wasn't proselyted into this. I didn't join this because I thought it would be cool or I want to be a part of the elite group. He said, I was naturally born a Jew. Second of all, he said, I was circumcised on the eighth day of my existence. That's what was required of Jewish males. If you were going to be a true Jew, you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. He said, I am of the stock of Israel. You don't understand what stock is until you're raising it. Can I get a witness over in that corner right there? Amen. You want to know that you've got good stock. You don't want to wind up investing in a bunch of sickly cows or, or scraggly looking chickens. Amen. Am, am I, how am I doing so far, right? I guarantee you, she's probably, Sister Susan probably been to some, some livestock shows or some livestock sales and looked at that and, Lord, have mercy, that poor animal, but I'm not taking it. Paula would take it. Paula would take it and nurse it back to health. Susan, you want it to be healthy when you get it, don't you? It's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm here to tell you straight up, folks. He said, I'm of the stock of Israel. I'm of the, find I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. When it comes to the law of God, I am a Pharisee. I don't know if you're aware of this. He never stopped being a Pharisee. He just didn't look like they looked. You know, everything a Pharisee saw that they did, they thought it was fair. That's why they were fair, you see. Makes you wonder about Sadducees, doesn't it? They didn't believe in the resurrection. They believed you were born, you lived, you died. <laughs> That's it. They don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. You'll never forget that. Somebody say Amen. You'll never forget that. Paul never stopped being a Pharisee. Paul was still a Pharisee, but he chose not to allow it to lead him as much as Christ led him. When it came to being zealous, he even started out because of his Pharisaical attachment. He persecuted the followers of Jesus Christ. And when it came to righteousness, oh my goodness gracious, it, the kind of righteousness that was defined by the law of God, and there's no greater righteousness than that, theoretically, he said, I was blameless. And yet, listen, out of all of that, that he could easily look to and count it as assets of his righteousness, his goodness, his godliness, he said, I count all of that as 
loss. Wait, 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 wait. Man, you, you know, you, you fill out an application and you put that on there. You know, you, I don't know when the last time some of y'all filled out an application, but they, they asked some questions, you know. Where did you first work? Where, what did you do when you were there? What, how, what, what awards did you receive while you were there? What accolades were given to you? Blah, 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 blah. Paul had it, or Saul as he was known back then. He had it all. But it wasn't sufficient enough because he said, I count them all this life. Why would he say that? Because he absolutely found the only thing that truly counted for anything in his life. He found Jesus Christ. Or should I say better yet, Christ found him. Jesus wasn't lost. We are the ones that are lost. We need Christ to find us. We need him to be like that shepherd that leaves the 99 and finds the hundredth one. Somebody say amen. We need him to be the one who takes and opens up everything and lights a light and goes around and sweeps all of the house until he founds that lost coin which we are. Friend, I'm here to tell you, he is the one who finds those that are lost, not the lost who find Christ because Jesus was never lost. To begin with, I want to ask you a question. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Paul said everything that anybody who is Jewish could find as a plus in their life, he said, I've got it all. we got people in this nation who want America to turn their back on Israel. They want the utter, complete, total destruction of Israel. Newsflash, that's what Hamas, Humus, Hamas, that bunch was trying to do the day that they attacked three months ago. I'm amazed at how they turned it all around and talked about how evil Israel was toward them. Do you know that Israel is the one who provided the electricity to Hamas? Without charge? No pun intended. Are you aware of all that Israel was doing for these people who had determined and made up their minds they had going to undermine Israel and destroy them? And when they made their attack that day, they stood before the cameras of the world and said, Look what Israel's doing to us. They're bombing us. They're shooting us. Um, That's why I'm not working for the news people of the world. I would be like, excuse me, um, weren't you the one that started this? It's like, oh, forget that. This is, this is the story you need to follow. <clears throat> you say, well, brother, no, that's ridiculous. Is it? That's what's happening in our nation. When we start to see something unfold before us, we are not seeing the news. We're being told what the story is supposed to be. Preach on, brother Nolan. Glory. I'll get in trouble. I don't care. Ask me if I care. Not a bit. Not a bit. Thank you. He said all of these things that the Jewish person would find as a plus, I count them all as rubbish, as garbage, as nothing, as manure is another reading or translation of that Greek word. It's something you don't want to mess with. It's something you don't want to get your hands dirty with. It's something you don't want to be around. It stinks. The things that I thought were so great that made me somebody are those things that stink. Paul understood that our righteousness was as filthy rags in the presence of God. We walk around, beat our ch- oh, I gotta kiss you. I gotta be careful about doing that now, don't I? Amen. You can't you can't knock that thing loose, can I? Good. I hope they put Gorilla glue on it so it doesn't come loose. Amen. I'll forget that again at some point. But we got to get to the place where we absolutely realize it's about God and not about us. Paul said, I count all those things as lost that I might gain Christ. For Paul, Paul said, if I hang on to that stuff, listen to me, if I hang on to that stuff, I cannot gain Christ. I'm going to say that again because somebody needs to hear about this in your life. You're holding on to something that you think you can. And Christ is trying to tell you, you can't gain him if you hang on to that. I've learned something a long time ago. You were never meant to be a tug of war rope. 
God's not going to be on one side pulling you and have those things or the enemy of your soul on the other side pulling. God will let go of the rope. His desire is not to tear you in half. His desire is not to destroy you. His desire is for you to understand there is no hope aside from Christ. There is no help aside from Christ. Satan has lied and lied and lied. And our nation is going down the toilet bowl of life, swirling big time, all because we desire to do our own thing. Preach, Brother Nolan. I believe I will. Well, what's it all about? Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories, let him glory in this. That he understands and knows me. What do you mean understand? I mean you know his word, therefore you know his will. You know him, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Don't tell me. I've had people try to do this come up to me and try to impress me with what they've been, how long they've been, where they've been, what they've been doing. Don't tell me how long you've been in the church unless you can tell me that you've known the Lord the entire time you've been here. Don't tell me what positions you've held in the church unless you can tell me that you knew the Lord and was doing it all for His glory and not your own. Don't tell me how much you gave, how much you sacrificed, how much you were blessed with, how much you did without, unless, unless you did it all for gaining more of Christ in your life. Woo! Hallelujah! He's a preaching now. Thank God the blood's flowing. Hallelujah! Listen to me. You need to ask yourself this question. What is my motivation? Why are you doing, quote unquote, what you're doing? The Bible says in First Col- or First Colossians, number one, Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Whatever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord and not to men. 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. Therefore, whether you eat or whether you drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Colossians 3, 17 says, And whatever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father as you do it. Somebody say amen. Man, this is good preaching even if I am doing it. You see, it's what's inside that counts. Paul said, he didn't just want to gain Christ, but he wanted to be found in Christ. He didn't so much desire that Christ would be found in him. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Don't miss this. It wasn't about finding Christ in him He desired more that Christ, he would be found in Christ. If you came up to him and you saw him, you said, oh, he's got Christ living in him. Paul would say to you, no, 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 I'm living in Christ. Look for me, you'll find me snuggled up inside Jesus Christ. My God, this is good stuff. I'm here to tell you too many people try to put Christ on as some kind of adornment, as some kind of a necktie or a tie pin or or some other kind of decoration. Friend, let me tell you, Christ is not a decoration in your life. Christ ought to be your life and nothing but your life. Somebody say amen. And I'm here to tell you, friend, if they find Jesus Christ, they need to find you all snuggled up, good and warm on the inside of Jesus Christ. Why? Because, friend, if you're not in him, who are you in? hate it when he throws us off like that. He wanted his righteousness to be that which was through faith in Christ and not from a religious list that was supplied to him. Even if it did come from the law and not everything the list was made up of came from the law. If he had that kind of righteousness by faith in Christ then he would be able to know Two things. Number one, that he would be able to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And not only would he know Christ and the power of his resurrection, but he would know Christ and 
the fellowship of his sufferings. You see, the early believers, you couldn't have one without the other. You couldn't have the power of his resurrection without knowing the fellowship of his sufferings. And if surely you knew the fellowship of his sufferings, at some point you would come face to face with the power of his resurrection. Oh, I'm, I'm, oh here, are you ready? Are you ready? Talk to me, preacher, and tell me about my new car I'm going to get. Talk to me, preacher, and tell me how good my stocks are going to do on the stock market. Talk to me, preacher. Bless me. Bless me, preacher, and tell me how glorious my kids are going to be as they grow up, the little heathens. Preach to me, preacher. Prophesy to me. Speak blessing over me. You can follow that if you want to. But somewhere along the line, that gospel just doesn't pan out. Somewhere along the line, that gospel fails. But the true gospel of Jesus Christ never fails, never falters, never ever is cast aside. Somebody say amen. Yes, who doesn't love to be blessed? I love to be blessed. You love to be blessed. We all love to be blessed. But the fun, funny thing about this is sometimes, sometimes things get in the way. Sometimes things get in the way. You hear what I'm saying? Sometimes things get in the way. You're not listening to me. Sometimes things get in the way. Let me tell you what I need. I need somebody that I can snuggle up inside. And it ain't Sister Nolan, amen. I love her. Don't get me, I love snuggling with her. It's one of the reasons I married her. And I'm going to get in trouble for saying that, but I don't care. But if I need help beyond this world and its material things, I need Jesus Christ, and I want to be found snuggled up in Him. Somebody say, I want to be found covered by Him. I want to be found enraptured in Him. I want to know, I want to know, I want to know, praise God, that He's got me. Hallelujah to God. Listen to me. I'm, I'm bringing this to a close. Somebody play some Brother Nolan Quinton music. Ultimately, Paul would become so possessed of Jesus Christ. Yes, I said possessed of Jesus Christ that he would be able to share in the death of Jesus Christ so that one way or the other he was going to share also in the resurrection from the dead. As they brought him there that day in Rome with his hands tied behind his back they led him to the chopping block. I don't know if the guy that wielded the axe that day was using a black mask like we see in all the movies or not. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. Paul didn't fight them like others had fought before. He made his journey to the chopping block. He got there and they didn't have to force him down on his knees. He willingly went down one at a time and my knees aren't what they used to be so I'm going to have to hold off going that far. But then they they came along and said, are you ready, Christian? Paul said, I am. I'm ready to be offered up. And he laid his head down and he said, Lord, as Christ said, I commit my spirit into your hands. And really before Paul knew it, the ax had swung severing through flesh, muscle, and bone. And one writer said it this way, as Paul's head rolled into the dust, his soul rolled into the arms of Jesus Christ, who said, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know when it's my time. I got this feeling I'm closer to it now than I've ever been before. I could be wrong. I'm okay if Jesus Christ just shows up and I'm out of here. But if I live long enough to die, I want to know that my death 
has not been in vain. There is not a one of you in here that I want to see go to hell. I won't even give you the finger to show you the way. It's a joke, okay? As much of a joke as I can make about that. Because hell is no joking matter, let's just be honest. And yet I'm amazed at how many people think immediately whenever they stick up their middle finger or in Europe when they stick up two fingers. I'm going to have to be careful about talking about number two around here. Nick will be upset in a couple weeks. He's been watching us, trying to get a feel for what God would have him to say. You see, the issue that we have is, is that if we're not careful, death will come and will catch us unawares. And I'm just going to be honest with you as I close this. I, I, I truly want to believe that I'm living closer to Christ now more than at any other time in my life. Is it perfect? No, I, I'm still an imperfect human being. But I'm trying. I'm trying real hard. And I'm convinced beyond anything in my wildest imagination, I'm convinced I'm doing my best to be an example to others of living in Christ by faith. For you see, I am convinced the best thing I can do, the best thing that any of us can do, Paul said it in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1, imitate me just like I'm also imitating Christ. Don't put yourself up as the pinnacle of what living is all. Point to Him. I'm just following the leader. I'm stepping where He steps. I'm doing what He's doing. I'm like short round with Indiana Jones. Remember that? Stand there. You touch nothing. You don't go anywhere. I stand here. I touch nothing. And that's the way we need to be. We need to follow Jesus like that. And only like that. And if you examine me long enough, you're going to find something you don't like. You probably already have. Like this message. But I preached it anyways because that's what God said to do. And I want to do what he wants me to do. And all I'm going to ask you is if you find something in me you don't like, I pray if you find anything in me like Jesus, do that. Share that. Live that. Because ultimately, I hear Jesus saying, if everyone in this church was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. That's all I ask To be like Him All through life's journey From earth to glory That's all I ask Is to be like Him Sing that with me one more time, would you? To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, that's all I ask, to be like Him all through life's journey, from earth to glory. That's all I ask to be like Him. Is that your prayer? Is that your hope, your desire? Right where you're at, would you pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to be more like Jesus. Help me to talk more like Jesus. Help me to love more like Jesus. Help me, Lord, to do your will like Jesus would do and help me to be the part of the church that's like Christ 
so that this church can be more like Christ. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you honestly can say, Pastor, I just don't know if I know Jesus or not. You're watching by live stream and you say, Hey, preacher, I just don't know if I know him as my Lord and my Savior. It's real simple. All you got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And if you'll call upon him, the Bible says in Romans 10 and 13, whosoever calls on him shall be saved. Won't you call on him right now? I'll be glad to meet with you in the altar and we'll pray together and seek God together. Or maybe you've got another need in your life. Do you need God to move upon and touch? He's interested. I said he's interested. He's not trying to push you off and say, not now, another time. He's saying right here, right now, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you find the answer. Today is the day that I come through for you. In the name of Jesus. Father, they're in your hands. I trust you. And I believe that they're in your hands, God. They can't be in any better set of hands anywhere in the universe. Now, God, be with them. Stay with them, God, Lord. Help them. Correct them. Show them the right way, God, Lord. Let them, Father, above all else, God, Lord, glorify you in everything in their life. We're going to trust you and believe you for that. For we dare to ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. We've got service tonight at 6 o'clock. Be sure and greet our visitors and let them know how much you appreciate them being with us today. Come back tonight. You just can't tell what the Lord's going to do. Amen. God bless you. Each and every one is our prayer.